Asyl, Tropical Island Survival, Week 2, Day 1. Because I took a nap yesterday, I didn't sleep well last night. Not that I've been sleeping particularly well anyway, waking up every couple of hours or so to stoke the fires. Without electric lights to help wake me up while it's still dark out, I keep waking up early or having to go to bed when I'm not sleepy because I can't do anything in the dark. At least it's sunny again today. I've started to establish a little routine in the mornings. Start the water distilling, collect, clean, and cook the fish from the trot lines, go into the woods and collect fruit and firewood. Incidentally, I cut up and placed the fruit I gathered the other day on a banana leaf this morning to dry in the sun, figuring they would be the first things to go bad. This routine will help me stay busy, build up a stockpile of food, and stay on top of any more unexpected setbacks like yesterday. I can't risk losing another productive day, as it could easily spell the end of me. I can't take a chance on losing my shelter either, so although I'm not ready to give up hope just yet, even though it's been a whole week now without rescue, I feel like I also need to begin easing into making preparations for the long haul. Constructing a sturdier shelter will probably make me more visible from the air. The first thing I need to do is take a little time to plan. The structure I need to build is mostly going to serve the functions of keeping out the rain, wind, and sun, rather than providing thermal insulation from ambient heat and cold. So I think what'll be the easiest thing for me to construct under these circumstances is going to be an almost wicker structure. I'll need to find some small trees or logs that I can use as the main posts, which must be fairly long, straight, and sturdy. Bamboo that grows here is of a relatively narrow variety, no wider than a few inches at the largest, so it probably won't be strong enough. That unfortunately leaves coconut palms as the longest, straightest, and sturdiest plants around, so I'll have to cut one down after all. I can then use my sharpened stick to dig holes into the ground to hold the logs upright. This may be more difficult on the beach where the ground is weak sand near the water and black rocks near the forest. This means I'll have to build the hut a little further inland, where the soil is mostly strong, packed clay. I think I'll make the walls circular, partly because I like that design, but also because round shapes generally have less resistance to the wind, and I've seen what the storms here can do. It'll also be a little easier to make the roof that shape, again, if I'm making it kind of like a giant basket. On that note, I think I may actually want to build the roof first, on the ground, or hoisting it up onto the posts as I erect them. It'll be a bit of a mess during assembly, but I think it'll be easier than me trying to lift the whole roof by hand. As I mentioned, it will consist of a conical woven frame, over which I'll layer palm branches for the shingles to keep the rain out, a lot like native buildings around the world. I'll leave some gaps at the top for smoke from my fire to escape through. Once the posts are up, I can use smaller branches in between them to weave an open lattice for the walls, and then broad grasses to seal the gaps so the wind is kept out. I'll orient the door away from the wind, and therefore away from the ocean, but I'll leave gaps for two windows so I can look out and see if any help is coming. This will probably take a few days, plus breaks every so often to restock my food and water supplies. Call it another week total. So, let's get started. I started by finding a spot just out of reach of the tide and adjacent to the rivulet, and then used a bit of cord and a stick to draw a perfect circle about 10 feet in diameter from a center point, marking six equidistant points on the perimeter, and using my piece of cord as a crude measuring tape to confirm their relative dimensions. At those points, I began digging the post holes with my sharpened stick, setting any clay I dug up aside for later use in making pottery. I also made some marks on the ground to remind me of where I wanted to put the door and windows later. Then it was time for the sad business of cutting down a coconut tree. I found a good, mostly straight-looking specimen a little ways inland, plenty of ripe-looking coconuts on it, not too far away from my camp, and started chopping. I wasn't used to chopping sideways, but I remembered the proper technique for cutting down a tree. You chop into it about halfway through on the side where you want it to fall, 
and then start chopping on the opposite side a little higher up. This ensures that the tree falls in the direction you want it to go, and that you're on the opposite side of the tree when it happens. Of course, they were using chainsaws when I saw it done, so it took a while to bring it down with just an axe. I still shouted an obligatory TIMBER before it went down, just for my own amusement. Once it was on the ground, I chopped off the branches and coconuts first. As much as the food was a temptation, I resolved to set some of the coconuts aside to germinate, to replace what I've taken from the island's ecosystem. I'm not sure how to otherwise propagate coconut trees, such as by runners or cuttings, or what the germination success rate is for each seed, so I'll keep several in reserve for this purpose. The branches I saved for my roofing shingles. The tree is too heavy for me to move in one piece to my base, so I'll have to chop it into six equal pieces, which I'll measure carefully with my cord again, and try to haul it away with my dolly if I can. If that fails, I might be able to roll them across the ground. I should keep my feet wide apart while chopping to avoid any chance of accidentally chopping my foot, which would probably be another death sentence out here. Whew. I managed to get all the logs over to the work site. I took a short break after that to collect a whole lot of bamboo and broad grasses before having lunch. My swinging arm is dead tired anyway. I'll strip some of the bamboo into cords while I'm eating. As an aside, while I was out cutting bamboo, I stumbled across a tall, jointed reed that looked a lot like bamboo, but when I cracked it open, I found it was solid in the center instead of hollow. I also noticed that it had a sweet smell, and when I tasted the sticky juice leaking from the cut stem, I realized that this was apparently sugar cane. I have no idea how it got here, but it seems to be growing wild just fine. After lunch, I anchored some of the prepared bamboo shoots into the ground, using my drawing in the sand as a guide, or bending them into arches to form a sort of dome or cone, weaving a few more bamboo shoots into a ring near the apex to form an oculus, leaving the tippy top open, as I said, to let smoke out. I wove more rings into the structure this way until I had a frame, and stopped. There's no need to finish sealing up all the gaps in it like a giant basket, which would take forever. Instead, I proceeded to simply tie the coconut leaves onto the frame, starting at the bottom and spiraling my way up to the top so that they will overlap each other like shingles and keep the rain out. I didn't have quite enough coconut fronds to make the roof as waterproof as I wanted, so I took a break to go collect more, many of which had fallen to the ground since the storm the other day. It crossed my mind that I could climb some of the trees and take a few fronds from each, but that would take forever and be an unnecessary risk to life and limb. Instead, I wandered around and took leaves from several of the banana plants, seeing they would make for more contiguous shingles. I then slipped them underneath the palm leaves I had already tied down, which will now function more for structural support and weight to hold everything down, and sandwiched in all the stray bamboo leaves I now have lying around in between them for sheer bulk protection. At this point, the roof is done, and it's not a bad little shelter in its own right. However, the height of the sun in the sky tells me that I'm not going to have time to erect the structure tonight. So after I remove the roof from its secure spot in the ground, I'll take some time to sharpen the ends of the logs with my axe, so they'll go into the ground deeper and more securely. I'll make sure to save the shavings for fire-starting tinder. I'll also chop some notches down the sides of the logs at equal intervals, since I'll have to secure bamboo sticks to them later, and this will help them from sliding up and down. I'll then roll the logs into their intended positions, parallel and pointing towards their respective post holes, with the roof frame adjacent to them. Week 2, Day 2 I spent the remainder of the evening last night, before refilling the distiller, having dinner and going to bed, cutting bamboo into cord and twisting it into honest-to-goodness rope, because I needed it to erect the posts today. I have so much salt stored away now that I decided to save myself some time and put the fish in the salt pot as soon as I was done flaying them, saving me time that I would otherwise spend cooking them. Besides that, 
I should probably start eating the fried fish meals I've already prepared before they have a chance to go rancid. The breadfruit will probably keep at this point. I'll give my bamboo rope a test before I get started, and make any adjustments or repairs I need to. There are a few places where I had to splice the cords together to extend the rope, and they have a tendency to slip. The addition of a few proper knots should fix that problem. I took my roof and tied it somewhat loosely to three of my posts, while tying my rope to the tops of the posts in three equal lengths. I then pulled on the ropes parallel to the direction I pointed the posts last night. I then continued pulling until they were standing up mostly straight. The rope made sure they were forced to stand up in one direction, and the roof made sure they wouldn't splay off to any one side, allowing me to basically erect most of the structure at once. I needed to use three posts at a time, otherwise the roof would have tipped to one side as I erected it, making it unruly to finish setting up. I then installed the remaining posts individually, and tied them to the roof before filling in the holes with clay, and packed them in tight so they wouldn't shift from side to side, using a rock on a piece of cord as a plumb line to make sure the posts were standing up straight first. Now that the hard and heavy part is over, it's time for the long and tedious part. I'll start setting vertical support rods of bamboo into the ground around the perimeter of the building, and secure their ends to the base of the roof frame, making cord as needed as I go. I'll leave a gap at the doorway and bend the bamboo into a tall arch for it, and for the windows, I'll only build the vertical rods part way up, leaving a gap where the windows will be. I'm going to make the windows intentionally wide, stretching from post to post to give me a good view of the ocean from inside. Then I'll weave the thinner pieces of bamboo into horizontal rings around the structure to create a basic frame, tying them to the vertical rods and posts as I go. Every now and then, I'll give it a shove to test it for structural strength, since this thing will need to endure strong winds occasionally. At this point, it's starting to actually look like something, though more of a big bird cage than a house. I could probably tie a bunch of palm or bamboo branches to the walls and be done with it, but where would be the fun in that? I picked all those broad grasses the other day just so I could weave them into the walls, and give the building a lovely basket-like appearance from the outside. So after a lunch break, that's what I'm going to do. They should also help direct wind around the building by following the grain of the weave, rather than getting caught up against it. Maybe not as good for keeping stray particles of rain out, but that's more or less what the roof is for. In order to create this woven structure, I'll first need to make the structural weave denser, adding more vertical and horizontal sticks to the frame, which will probably take most of the rest of the day. Now it looks more like a big wicker laundry basket. It's basically finished as a structure now. So I'm going to spend the last hour of the day moving my stuff inside, starting with carefully transplanting the kiln into the center of the hut. There's plenty of room inside to store my kayak, pots, and firewood, though I'll still keep my raft tent out in the open where it can be seen. It kind of gives me the warm fuzzies because it's starting to almost feel like moving into a real house. I find this response a bit odd for me, though, because I always hated moving the disruption to my normal surroundings and routine. What makes it different this time? Week 2, Day 3 After the morning chores, I started working on the grass weave of the walls, and it took the entire morning, but it's done now. I was trying to convince myself to do it some easier way the whole time, but the sunk cost fallacy had completely taken over by that point. And to a certain degree, I didn't mind that. I was starting to enjoy the artistry of it. My arms are still really tired, though, so I'm going to take a long lunch break to recuperate from all that work. At the same time, I'm thinking about next steps. My hut could use some homey touches. I need a door and shutters for the windows. And given the design of the hut so far, I've got the idea to make them slide around the hut's circumference making another wall inside of it as a nested cylinder that slides around to cover the windows and doors all at once, like something out of one of my mist lakes. However, 
my burning fingers and arms do not like the idea of basically having to build the entire wall structure a second time, so I'll shelf that idea for the moment. I figure the easiest way to make a sliding door is to make a rail out of bamboo. However, while I can just rest the bottom edge of the door and shutters on a couple of perpendicular sticks, like rollers, I'll need something curling over the edge of the roof to hold the top of the sliding door in place. The more I think about it, the more it seems like a singular support structure for both the door and the shutters is actually going to be the easiest, because the rails are going to have to go around 360 degrees either way for all of the sliders to open, so I might as well attach them to the most secure parts of the structure, namely the floor and the ceiling. The only problem would be that I can't mount anything to the walls with this frame getting in the way, though with the exception of the posts, I don't think the walls would be strong enough to hang anything on anyway. I spent some time drawing everything out on the sand until I was happy with the design, so now I'm going to get started on the rollers. I had to use my bow drill to put some holes in each bamboo segment, which I wedged another stick or piece of bamboo into to make strong, perpendicular joints. I then stuffed a stick or other piece of bamboo shaped fit into each hole, and secured a cap over each hole with a single slightly larger segment of bamboo, creating a simple roller. I did this twice, bending both roller bars into contiguous rings, which I then tied to the hut structure. The one on the floor barely needed any securing, as tension should mostly hold it in place, but I tied it down anyway. The rollers angled slightly upward to keep the finished product in place. The one on the ceiling I bent into a circle slightly smaller than the outer wall, with its rollers pointing mostly downward, but this presented me with two problems. Firstly, I couldn't quite reach the ceiling, so I had to stop and build a ladder, again constructed of notched bamboo pieces lashed together with cord. Secondly, the rollers kept falling off the pegs I made for them, so I poked a hole in the ends of the partitions in the bamboo caps, running a bit of cord through them, which was tied to the pegs. I then tied the cord to a stick too wide to fit through the hole, kind of like my backpack button, and that should keep the roller caps in place while still allowing them to rotate freely. Only now do I realize that the pegs by themselves would probably have been enough. Now to build the rotating wall frame. First, I bent some bamboo into rings of equal size, such that they fit snugly within the roller bars. Next, I drilled holes in them, like the roller bars, and secured vertical lengths of bamboo into the holes to form a tall cylinder. I found I couldn't tie them onto the rings like the outside wall, because if the vertical bars were offset from the rings, they would rub up against the posts. As I filled in the frame for the inner wall, I naturally left gaps in it where the windows and door are going to go. Finally, I wove in some horizontal support rings and made some frames for the window and door. This was kind of tricky to do since I couldn't get to both sides of the wall, but I pulled it off before the sun went down. Now that the frame is mostly finished, it looks like I'm turning the hut into a beachside prison when I rotate the inner wall. I'm going to finish preparing my water ration for tomorrow before going to bed. Week 2, Day 4 Just for fun, I set the inner wall to cage mode when I went to sleep. I'm not sure if it makes me feel more secure or more trapped. When I woke up in the morning, I was surprised to find something hanging from the eaves of my hut. It was a great big fruit bat, a Samoan flying fox to be precise. Unfortunately, though, when I rolled my wall frame to see if I could feed it some of my fruit, it got scared and flew away. Probably wouldn't have liked the fruit anyway, because I'd dried it out. Anyway, I'll go catch my fish and start distilling more water. Firewood's starting to get low, so I should go collect some more, along with some more broad grasses and bananas in case the fruit bat comes back. When I was done with my morning chores, I got started on weaving the covering for the inner wall, just like the outer wall. At first I figured I'd just cover the segments of the cylinder that would cover the windows and door, so it wouldn't take as long, but soon found I couldn't really do half measures, as turning the cylinder in completely just left exposed the cage-like framework, so I did the whole thing. Now that it's done, though, I'm quite tickled with it. 
For some time, I couldn't help just spinning it around back and forth. I never get to make complicated mechanical structures like this at home. The only real problem with it is that you have to walk over the rotating rail at the entrance, which makes it a trip hazard, and I don't want to end up accidentally falling face first into a hot kiln. Let's take a moment to think about my options. I think a raised floor might be nice, but my only concern is that this may cause dirt and detritus to get into the rotating wall mechanism, gumming it up. I can't chop out that part of the frame though, otherwise the door is going to catch every time the frame rotates. Making a step up over the frame only to step back down into the hut just feels kind of silly, so I suppose a raised floor is the best option. I figure I could make it by laying bamboo on the floor, but that would feel hard on my feet, so instead I should make the platform out of packed clay. The raised floor needs to be a cylinder 3 inches high and 10 feet in diameter, so it will require about 20 cubic feet of clay. I estimate I can dig out about 1 cubic foot per minute of dirt with my stick, so between digging, watering, and carrying the dirt to my hut, it shouldn't take more than half an hour to an hour. Besides, I've still got some clay from digging out the post holes. I spent an hour or so removing everything from my hut except the kiln, and found a good spot to start digging up more clay. I made sure not to fill the platform near the rim of the inner wall, or the kiln, leaving a sort of bowl-shaped depression around the kiln so that I can remove it again if I need to, and put a fire pit in its place if need be. I kept the kiln running while I poured in and shaped the floor, which won't generate enough heat to fire the floor to terracotta, but it will help it dry out faster. Unfortunately though, combined with the walls reflecting the heat back at me, it was still too hot for me to stand being in there for more than a minute or two. Just before I finished the floor, I had a clever idea and tied some stiff palm bristles and other plant material to the lower rim of the inner wall. The platform basically opens up to the outside at the doorway, so by using these bristles as a brush, any particles that fall into the crack around the rim of the building will be swept out towards the doorway as the rim gets rotated. I'm rather proud of that one. While I and my equipment wait for the clay floor to dry, I'll use the broad grasses I have left to weave a mat for the entrance, as the step up reminds me of a construction feature from Japanese homes, the name of which escapes me. Sort of a depression at the front door where they have to take off their shoes before entering the house. I decided there was no point walking on a hard, dirty clay floor in my bare feet either, so I collected some more grass and began weaving mats for the entire inside floor. I changed my weaving pattern to take advantage of the fact that the grasses are wider on one side than the other. This allowed me to make trapezoidal mats that will ring the inside of the inner floor better than the square ones. These mats will take me till the end of the day to finish, but just to make sure the floor is dry and doesn't crumble or anything when I try to step on it, I'll sleep in the raft tent tonight. Week 2, Day 5 At one point I got up in the middle of the night to stoke the fire as usual, and noticed when I left the hut that there was a fair amount of light coming out of the windows, even with the kiln hiding most of the fire. If I were using an open fire pit, that would probably make it even easier to see from the ocean at night, not to mention conspicuous, since the hut has two windows, definitely indicating that it's a man-made structure to anyone viewing the island at night from a boat. I finished my morning chores now, and decided to dedicate today to making some furniture for my beach hut. At the very least, I need a bed, a table, a chair, and since I can't hang anything heavy on the walls, I'm going to need some shelves. Also, the light shed by the kiln last night gave me an idea to make a lamp to see by at night, and to make my hut more visible without having to burn a whole forest's worth of wood every night. I started with the lamp because it would take all day to dry, and most of the night to cook. I'll use some of my leftover clay to make a sort of clay fire labor or brazier, much like the pots I've made so far but this time I'll use some thin pieces of bamboo to make internal supports and circular apertures around the sides, like those old-timey signal lanterns they used to have on trains, leaving one side filled in with clay and smoothed down to reflect the light out. I'll also make a large clay dish with four holes in it to catch the light from the lantern and reflect it back down into the hut, 
which would help provide diffuse illumination without burning my eyes by looking directly at a bright fire anymore. I finished shaping my lantern parts and left them both to sit in the sun all day. Next I went to the forest and collected some more bamboo for my furniture. I feel like it's worth acknowledging that I've chopped down a lot of bamboo so far, but it does tend to grow in dense clusters and dominate wherever it does. It is a kind of grass after all, so there should be plenty more of it for me to cut around the island. I still feel like I should be planting more than I take, if not for the island, then for sustainability, assuming I'm stuck here for very long. The shoots at the tip of the bamboo plants are pretty soft, and largely useless for building structures, but I've seen people growing short lengths of bamboo in offices by immersing them in water, regrowing their roots from their segments again. So for every bamboo stalk I cut down, I'm going to try and replant the stalk so I can at least maintain, if not increase, the amount of bamboo available to me over time. With my lumber sorted, I'm going to start by building a chair, because it's small and I want to get a little practice before moving on to the bigger items of furniture. I started on the chair by making a simple square frame with a diagonal crossbar to reinforce it, cutting holes in the vertical and horizontal members, and slots in the ends of the diagonals to fit into them like pegs, securing everything together with cord. I used the distance from my foot to my knee to determine how tall the chair should be for comfortable sitting. I then added more frames to this structure until I had a box. Finally, I cut some thin pieces of bamboo into strips that I wove onto the top frame to make a wicker seat. After almost two weeks, I didn't realize how good it felt to just sit in a proper chair rather than on the ground with a log. Just having this thing is going to make building everything else so much more comfortable. I feel it's also worth noting that I left the seat detached from the rest of the frame, connected by only a couple of strips of cord that function as a hinge. This is so I can use the stool as a box to store stuff in later, or as a toilet, since I'm getting tired of using the ocean every time I need to poop. I'll create a second seat frame with a hole in it to sit on and sacrifice one of my water jars to use as a chamber pot. At least the lid should do a decent enough job of keeping the smell in. I think the lantern pot should be dry enough to start cooking by now. The next thing I started building was a desk, and at first, I tried to make the legs using an arch of bamboo instead of a diagonal crossbar to provide better structural support. However, I couldn't find a way to maintain the tension on the arch without causing the legs of the desk to splay, so I just used diagonals in the corners, leaving room for my legs to get under. Finally. I wove the tabletop the same way I made the seat lid. Initially, I thought I'd get it done faster if I just laid lengths of bamboo across the top of the frame, but I decided I wanted everything to be on theme. This is very unusual for me. I've never cared so much about aesthetics until now, and honestly, I've kind of detested it as a motive in others, at least when it conflicts with the function of an object or space. Maybe I need to change my tune. The desk surface was mostly flat, but had enough give to it that I thought it would make an excellent box spring for my mattress. With that in mind, I started making the bed almost exactly like the desk, but longer and with legs the same height as my stool. I'm getting good enough at weaving now that I can make sure the wicker surface is strong enough to support my weight. I should sleep measurably more comfortably now. Before I go to bed, though, I finished firing the lantern pot I made and as soon as it's cool enough to handle, I'll run some cords underneath it for support up through the holes in the overhead plate and tie them to the ceiling. Week 2, Day 6 I put a little burning plant material in the lantern last night and aimed the open side out the windows so the hut would be easier to see at night from the ocean. The wide dish reflected most of the remaining light down onto my desk, so I could see to work a little later than usual, which will improve my daily productivity, as well as my sleep schedule. It's still not very bright, but it's much brighter than the kiln, and easier on my eyes. I spent my time after dark constructing a pair of shelves to store my stuff on, and to keep it out of kicking and tripping range, though my own shadow often kept getting in the way of the lantern light. This time I did just use bamboo slats for the shelf surfaces because it was late, I wanted to finish, and 
I still couldn't see too well. It seemed to have held the weight of my equipment, food, and water jars just fine overnight, and I can't help but notice how it made my sleep that much sweeter with everything put away in a neat and tidy manner. I've been so busy with building the beach hut, though, that I haven't been collecting firewood, so after I was done fishing this morning, I used what shavings I had left over from the construction work to keep the fire going while I secured more wood and fruit from the forest. Up till now, I've been mostly using any old fallen branches and logs I can find, but I'm starting to think of using the bamboo. Admittedly, it's not a great fuel source, as it's mostly hollow, but it is abundant and grows back fast, and by fast I mean about a year. For the moment, though, it's more useful to me as a building material, but if I must use it for firewood in the future, I would prefer to do so after growing it in ecologically sustainable quantities first, but that's way down the road, and only if I'm stuck on the island, which I must admit seems increasingly likely. I looked for wood for a couple of hours, since I want to be stocked up for the Sabbath. While I was out, I discovered a clearing up the hill away from my hut, adjacent to the rivulet. I'm starting to fill up my pot of dried food, so I'd probably better start making more pots, this time stockpiling them so they have plenty of time to dry and make the most of every little bit of heat the kiln generates, so I'll try to keep a pot cooking on it at all times, until I don't have room for any more. Besides, some of my earlier ones may have started to develop cracks. I stopped to have lunch, and I feel like I'm kind of losing the plot again. I took a moment to figure out what I have, what I can do, and what I need to do, and during this inventory check, I found that my fish had started to stink, like more than usual, which means it's probably dried improperly and gone bad. I think the problem was that, in trying to avoid getting the salt into the fish, drying it by evaporative desiccation, it gave bacteria too much time to grow and didn't give the salt a chance to desiccate them. I was trying to be too smart for my own good, so I'll have to throw that batch of fish out. I can't risk getting sick, even if food were scarce. In the future, I'll need to cut the fish super thin, pack it in salt directly, and heat it or soak it in brine first. Besides, I tend to like salty food, and at this point, fresh water appears to be no object. Another thing I realize at this point is that, now that I have the walls up, I can't stand the heat generated by the kiln because the walls hold it in, so I'll take some time to carefully remove the kiln and set it outside. It's not going to be hurt by the weather anyway, and it'll be easier to see from the ocean. I've basically got the remaining half of the day to myself. I've got food, water, shelter, and wood squared away for a while. I need to know what natural resources I have to work with, so I think I'll spend the remainder of the day exploring the island and collecting plant specimens. It'll give me something to do tomorrow anyway. As I conducted my little expedition today, instead of just taking the bits and pieces of the plants I needed, like I've been doing up till now, this time I took as much of each specimen with me as I could, so I could study all its parts and possibly cultivate them, because it's really starting to look like I might have to be here for a while. While I was out and about, I took one of my coconut shells to the breadfruit tree I've been keeping an eye on, and decided to see if I could tap it for latex. I remember from rough science that they had to make a diagonal cut along the tree, where the sap would trickle down, and then put the tap at the bottom, where it would drip into the coconut shell. I used a short, split piece of bamboo for the spout, and carved a relatively deep gouge into the tree to shove it into and keep it stable, placing the coconut shell on the ground below the spout to catch any latex that drips out. I'll check on it tomorrow. It's such a small island that it didn't take me very long to traipse through most of the jungle and get a pretty good representative sample of the available flora. I collected bark from various likely plant specimens, mostly from the fig trees, breadfruit trees, and others, because I know I'm going to need paper to write all my notes and botanical illustrations on. I never realized until now that there is a sort of structure to bark built-in layers of varying strengths and properties, kind of like human skin, though I suppose they shouldn't be too surprising, as they perform a similar function. I used my knife to strip the inner bark from the various tree bark specimens, and mashed the resulting strips together with a likely-looking stone, 
in a manner reminiscent of how I understand the ancient Egyptians used to make papyrus paper. I then left the pages to dry around the kiln and in the sun. I figured I'm going to need a better pencil too, so I found a narrow piece of bamboo and used a stick to ram some charcoal into the hole as hard as I could until the piece of bamboo was full. Hopefully this will make the charcoal hard and allow me to use my knife to sharpen the bamboo to a point at the end, like a traditional pencil. It was a fast enough process that I was able to repeat it a few times to get the pencil lead recipe just right, adding a binder to the charcoal, like a little water and clay, as I understand that's how pencil lead is actually made. Who says no one on earth knows how to make a traditional pencil anymore? I also set one of my pots firing, and that should wrap me up for the day. Week 2, Day 7 It's my day off, so after my morning chores and setting a new pot to fire, I got to work on describing and experimenting with the most noteworthy plant specimens I've collected so far. I don't actually know the scientific or even some of the colloquial names for several of them, so on occasion I guess I'll have to make some up as I go along. I will list here a description of each plant and its easily discernible uses. As I go, I'll be tasting and eating the different parts of each specimen in small quantities to test for edibility and medicinal properties. Each description and drawing will probably take about an hour, which is plenty of time for symptoms of poisoning or other effects to kick in before moving on to the next one, but hopefully not in large enough quantities to hurt me severely. Anything that is particularly bitter, I'll just spit straight out, as it tends to indicate the presence of natural poisons and alkalis. Coconut Palm Fibrous roots, tall trunk, crown of large fronds and clusters of fruit at the top. Fruits are surrounded by a fibrous husk and contain coconut milk and meat. Useful for food, water, cooking oil, containers, roofing, wood. Bamboo Tall, fast-growing grass, grows in segments, 50 foot maximum height, 3 inch maximum diameter. Leaves grow in clusters off the sides, propagate via roots and presumably seeds. Useful for lumber, small containers, firewood, cord, etc. Vanilla grass. A plant with long, grass-like leaves radially symmetric about a central stalk. Spreads through runners. Leaves are useful for weaving mats and outerwear, and have a sweet vanilla-like scent when cut non-toxic, possible culinary applications as a flavoring agent. Harakeke, a long, broad-leafed grass that produces a tall stalk with red flowers, useful for weaving and fibers. Banana, large leaves with parallel veins, growing from a tall, flaky stalk. Fruit grows in large clusters, yellow or orange skin when ripe, bright yellow meat, green flowers, male and female, magenta-colored sap, spreads through runners or suckers and through seeds. Useful for food, leaves useful for shingles, mats, disposable plates, waterproof coverings, etc. Veins useful for rope making, sap useful for dye. Breadfruit, a tall branching tree with lobed leaves like oak or maple. Fruit grows from the ends of the branches with green, bumpy, or spiky skin and white, starchy flesh. Propagates by seeds and runners. Useful for food, wood, and latex. Strangler fig. Tree with smooth, light gray trunk and glossy oval leaves. Epiparasite that grows on and up other trees, eventually killing them. Produces tangled curtains of roots that grow from the canopy to the ground. Green fruit grows at the tips of the branches, turning red or purple when ripe and falling off, pollinated by wasps that lay their eggs and die inside the fruit. Useful for food, wood, latex, and bonsai. Bark useful for paper. Taro. Broad, triangular slash heart-shaped leaves growing from a starchy underground corm. Grows in marshy soil, leaves and root useful for food. Sugar cane, grass with tall segmented stalk and long leaves at the tip, 
produces a fluffy flower stalk at the very top. It grows from runners or stalk cuttings. It prefers fertile soil with good drainage. Useful for sugar production. Leftover pulp may be useful for paper. Purple Yam Creeping vine with pointy heart-shaped leaves and large tubers with purple flesh appears to spread via overground runners. Starchy tubers edible but must be cooked to deactivate toxins. Bottle Gourd Creeping vine with spade-shaped serrated leaves, small five-petaled flowers, and large round fruit that resembles bottles. Fruit seems edible but slightly bitter, safer to cook it. Leftover rinds were found to form a hard shell when left out in the sun to dry for a long time. May be useful for storage of liquids or construction of utensils. Turmeric plant with large triangular parallel veined leaves growing from a central stalk with a cluster of light purple flowers at the top. It grows from a multi-lobed root with bright yellow or orange flesh. Root has a spicy flavor that I don't really like. Potentially useful as a dye. Red pine cones. Small plant with long elliptical leaves that grow from a central stem growing from rhizomes in the ground and terminating in a bright red flower shaped like a pine cone. Sweet ginger scent created upon picking the leaves or mashing the tissues. Bitter flavor indicates that it is not edible. Frangipan flower. A small tree or shrub with long trunks or branches terminating in radially symmetric, long elliptical leaves with parallel veins and sweet-smelling flowers with five petals that come in a variety of colors, including white, yellow, orange, pink, and red. The textures of the petals resemble frangipan, making them look almost fake. No obvious uses. Jasmine. Creeping or climbing vine with small, narrow leaves and small, sweet-smelling flowers with five petals. No obvious uses. I have to take a few breaks during the day to stretch my legs and give my drawing and writing hand a break, but overall I'd say this was a pleasant exercise. I don't get a lot of opportunities to just sit down and draw like crazy anymore, and it reminds me of the time I was inspired by rough science to try and catalog the various plants in the forests around my home and their practical uses, like some kind of naturalist journal. I guess that's kind of coming in handy now. Blooper reel. All right. Starting the day off right. Okay, new strategy for recording. I will just go with whatever and uh, hold on to my mistakes, I guess, and leave that for uh, the editor to deal with later. Oh, wait. The editor's me. I can't, risk, I can't risk losing another productive day. If nothing else, constructing a sturdier shelter will probably... Just for my own amusement. Just for my own amusement. Seeing they would make for a... Seeing they would make for a more contiguous... Seeing they would make for more contiguous shingles. I'll first need to... I'll first need to make the structure... I'll still... I'll first need to make the structural weave denser, starting with carefully, starting with carefully trans, starting with carefully transplant, starting with carefully transplanting the kiln into the center of the hut. The disruption, the disruption to my routine, the disruption to my normal surroundings and routine. I was trying to convince myself to do it some easier way the whole time, but the sunk cost, but the sunk cost fallacy has. But the sunk cost fallacy had completely taken over by that point. The only problem would be that I can't mount anything to the walls of this frame. The only problem would be that I can't mount anything to the walls of this frame getting in the way. Okay. Okay, let's try that again. The only problem would be that I can't... I did this twice, bending both roll... 
bending both roller bars into, contigu into contiguous rings. The one on the floor barely needed any secure. Barely needed any secure. Betty. Secondly, bleh. Now that the frame is mostly finished, it looks like I'm turning the. It looks like I'm turning the. Now, bump, 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 bump. Who's that at me door? Along with more broad grasses and bananas in case the fruit bag comes up. Bleh. As turning the cylinder incompletely just left exposed, cage like the frame look. Just left exposed, cage like. Just left exposed. Wait, what? Okay, that must be a mistake. Wait, where am I? The only real problem with it is that you have to. The only real problem with it is that you. The only real problem with it is that you have to walk over the. Making a. Making a. Making a step over the frame. Only to step back down. Mm. Making a frame. I spent an hour or so. I spent an hour or so. I spent an hour o <laughs> I sp Words mean nothing. So by using these bristles as a brush as a brush, and since I can't hand and since I can't hang a since I can't hang anything heavy on the walls since I can't hang anything heavy on the walls, leaving one side filled in with clay and smoothed down to reflect the to make internal supports and circular and sink which should help which should help provide which should help provide the, 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 the if not for the island then for then for sustainability if not for the island then then for stain then for sustainability I'll run some cords underneath it for support for support up up through the holes I've been so busy with building the beach hut that I thought I've been so bu I've been so busy with as I conducted my little expedition today instead of just taking bits and pieces of the plants I what why, why did I write it like that to test for edibility and med and medicinal proper and medicinal properties. <clears throat> leftover rinds found. Leftover rinds found full. Hmm. Hey there! You made it all the way to the end. Thanks for listening. I'm planning on making a new video slash audio segment every week for the foreseeable future, concurrent with my stay on the island. Every time I can catch a seagull, that is. So, if you like this and want to listen to the next one as soon as it drops, hopefully on time, you can press the Taco Bell button under the video, and a seagull will come pecking at your window looking for enchiladas as soon as I'm done tying the episode to them. Now, I'm not doing YouTube for money, but it would still help me out if you press the subscribe button, because each sub pokes the YouTube algorithm awake, so it'll hopefully see the light from my hut at night. It's notoriously lazy, though, so it would help me out more than anything else if you could share this video with someone you think would enjoy it. Talking of which, there's a like button under the video that you can press as well. And I've discovered that every time someone presses that button, it calls the fruit bat back to my hut so I can give it a banana. There's also a dislike button next to it, but I'm pretty sure that'll do the opposite. You're welcome to press it, of course, but if Christofferson flies away and faints from hypoglycemia somewhere over the Pacific Ocean, don't say I didn't warn you. Also, if you'd like to chat about your own stories and perspectives on the episode, feel free to catch your own seagull and write it on the comments section on its back, as it's still pretty lonely out here. Maybe you could share some of your tips and stories about building a house or hut, or guess the scientific names of some of the plants I've found. I welcome suggestions and corrections, as long as they're constructive. That said, thanks for listening, and hope to see you here again next week.